اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما Over the last couple of weeks we spoke about Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anh and his role during the Treaty of Hudaybiyah which was in the sixth year of the Hijrah and then we spoke about his role in the Battle of Khaybar which was in the seventh year of the Hijrah now the next year after the expedition of Khaybar an incident happened where the Quraysh broke the terms of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah that was agreed upon two years earlier. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah was in the sixth year of the Hijrah. Now we're in the eighth year of the Hijrah. So in the eighth year of the Hijrah, the Quraysh, they broke the treaty. They broke one of the terms of the treaty. And as we mentioned, from the terms of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah is that the Muslims and the Quraysh agreed to be at peace for a period of 10 years, that there would be no wars between the Quraysh and the Muslims for a period of 10 years. So if the Quraysh starts any type of aggression against the Muslims, then they would be breaking the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. If the Muslims were to start any type of aggression against the Quraysh, then the Muslims would have been violating the terms of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So both sides agreed that there will be no uh, aggression that is started by either side for a period of 10 years. So now only two years had passed and the Quraysh, they broke the treaty. How did they break the treaty? From amongst the terms of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah also was that any tribe that wanted to align itself with the Quraysh could do so. And any tribe that wanted to align itself with the Muslims could do so. So those tribes that align themselves with the Quraysh, they are bound by the same rules. And those tribes that align themselves with the Muslims, they are bound by the same rules as the Muslims. So the tribe of Banu Bakr, they align themselves with Quraysh. And the tribe of Khuza'ah, they align themselves with the Muslims. And this is very important. Because now, if the tribe of Banu Bakr, which is aligned with Quraysh, if they attack any tribe that is aligned with the Muslims, then that would automatically make the Quraysh in breach of the terms of Hudaybiyah. Even if the Quraysh themselves did not start the aggression, if a tribe that is aligned with them start aggression, then it is as if the Quraysh have started aggression. They would be breaking the terms of the treaty. So this is an important point. The tribe of Banu Bakr, they aligned themselves with Quraysh. The tribe of Khuza'a, they aligned themselves with the Muslims. So what happened in the eighth year of the Hijrah, two years after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was agreed upon? The tribe of Banu Bakr, which was aligned with Quraysh, attacked the tribe of Khuza'a, which was aligned with the Muslims. So an ally of the Quraysh attacked an ally of the Muslims. So now who is in breach of the treaty? Who has violated the treaty? The Quraysh. And in addition to this, when Banu Bakr started this aggression against Khuza'a, Quraysh, they helped Banu Bakr with this as well. The Quraysh, they got involved themselves and they actually participated in the aggression against Khuza'a as well. So now the Quraysh are clearly in violation of the terms of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. They broke the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Ten years of peace was agreed upon. They broke it after two years. So someone from the tribe of Khuza'a was able to escape and reach Medina. Someone from the tribe of Khuza'a ran to Medina, fled to Medina to inform the Prophet Muhammad wasallam of what has happened. That Banu Bakr attacked us and Quraysh helped them. So this man from Khuza'a who was able to flee to Medina, he was a man named Amr ibn Salim. So Amr ibn Salim, he comes to Medina and he informs the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of what has happened. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after hearing about this, what has happened, hearing that the Quraysh has broken the treaty, he said, Nusirta ya Amr ibn Salim. Nusirta ya Amr ibn Salim. You will be helped. 
O Amr bin Salim. Meaning, the Muslims are with you, we are your allies, and we are going to help you, and we are going to make sure that this aggression is accounted for. So the Prophet ﷺ started preparing an army. Now the Quraysh have broken the treaty. So now the Muslims, they have the right to go and take over the Quraysh and take over Mecca. So the Prophet ﷺ, he started preparing an army to launch a surprise attack on the Quraysh. And the beautiful thing is that during these two years between the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah and this incident, the Muslims were able to grow at a very fast rate because the Quraysh were not hindering them for those two years. So the Muslims, alhamdulillah, they were able to, they were able to, 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 to increase their numbers during those two years much more than they had been able to increase before that time. Because the Quraysh were always blocking them and you know, causing problems for them and putting roadblocks in their way, starting aggression against them, fighting against them. But now, without interference from the Quraysh for two years, Alhamdulillah, the Muslim, the Muslim numbers grew exponentially during those two years. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the, the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah uh, a clear victory. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. Surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has, has granted you a clear victory. The Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, it was really a turning point for the Muslims and Islam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, now he starts preparing an army to launch a surprise attack on the Quraysh. And now the Muslim army is much stronger than the army of the Quraysh and much bigger in number as well than the army of the Quraysh. Because now so many tribes in these two years so many tribes have accepted Islam and they are part of the Muslim army as well. So the army of the Prophet ﷺ was very big compared to the army of the Quraysh. You know, just a few years ago, it was the other way around. Remember Badr and Uhud? The Muslims were always the ones who were outnumbered in the beginning. But now it's the other way around. Tides have turned. Now the Muslim army is very big and the army of the Quraysh is, is much smaller in number. They cannot face the Muslim army. So the Prophet ﷺ, after hearing what had happened, he started preparing an army with the intention of launching a surprise attack on the Quraysh. He didn't want to give Quraysh any type of information beforehand that we're coming to Mecca, we're going to take over Mecca. He didn't want the Quraysh to know this. He wanted it to be a surprise attack. And because he wanted it to be a surprise attack, he started preparing the army and he didn't even tell the army. He didn't even tell his own army what they were preparing for. That we're going on an expedition, we're going somewhere, but he didn't tell them. He didn't even tell the Muslim army where he was going because he didn't want any information to leak and reach Mecca, what the Muslims were planning. Because if any information leaked to Mecca and the Quraysh found out, then of course, you know, they would prepare themselves. They would probably try to get support from other tribes as well. And, you know, in that situation, if the, if the Quraysh are prepared, it would become an all-out battle and a lot of blood would be shed. People would die from both sides, right? The Prophet ﷺ didn't want that. Rather, he wanted it to be a surprise attack because if he's able to come with his army to Mecca as a surprise and the Quraysh were not expecting it, then in that situation, if they're not prepared, they would have no other choice but to peacefully surrender. They're not going to fight against the Prophet ﷺ and his army without any support or without any preparation. If they see that the Prophet ﷺ and his army are here in Mecca, they would have no other option except to peacefully surrender. So this is what the Prophet ﷺ wanted. He didn't want any blood to be shed, not on the Muslim side, nor on the side of the Quraysh. Even out of mercy for the Quraysh, he didn't want blood on their side to be shed as well. So for this reason, he, he wanted to keep this operation top secret. So he didn't even tell his army. He's preparing the army. We're going on an expedition, but he didn't tell them where. Right? He only told a few of his senior companions. The only people who knew were a few companions like Abu Bakr radiallahu an, Umar radiallahu an, Ali radiallahu an. Right? They were the ones who knew and a few others. But other than them, other than these most senior companions, Prophet sallallahu did not tell the rest of the army what they were what they were planning and where they were going because he wanted to make sure that no leak reaches the Quraysh. He also ordered the borders of Medina to be closed. No one can leave Medina. Until this army is prepared and we're ready to go, the borders of Medina are closed. 
He wanted to keep it very tight security so no one can escape from Medina, no, no one can go out from Medina and go to Mecca and inform the Quraysh what the Prophet ﷺ is doing. And the reason why the Prophet ﷺ did all of this, it was out of his mercy. He didn't want blood to be shed. He didn't even want the blood of, of, of the Quraysh to be shed. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ, he's making this, these preparations, preparing the army. So the, the Muslim army knows that, okay, we're going somewhere. We're going for some type of expedition, some type of conquest, but we, but we don't know where we're going. Now there was one companion, his name was Hatib ibn Abi Balta'ah radiallahu anhu. Hatib, he heard Amr ibn Salim from Khuza'ah when he came into Medina to tell the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa what happened. He happened to hear that, that Amr ibn Salim has come and he told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that oh, the tribe of Banu Bakr has attacked Khuza'ah and the Quraysh helped them. Hatib heard all of this. So he knew that the Quraysh had committed an act of betrayal and they violated the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So he knew that much. The Quraysh has breached the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Then immediately after this, he sees that the Prophet ﷺ is preparing an army. So he puts two and two together. Quraysh have broken the treaty. And now the Prophet ﷺ is preparing an army. It means most likely he's preparing this army to go and conquer Mecca. He put it together. The Prophet ﷺ didn't tell him. He was not from those companions that the Prophet ﷺ told where they were going. But he put it together himself. So he, he figured out that the Prophet ﷺ is preparing this, this conquest to go into Mecca. Now, Hatib ibn Abi Balta'ah radiallahu anhu, he was a great companion of the Prophet ﷺ. He was from the companions who had participated in all of the battles with the Prophet ﷺ up to this point. From the Battle of Badr. He was from Al Badriyin. The, the companions of Badr, they have a very high special status. And Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a, he was one of them. Now Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a, his situation was, he was from the Muhajireen. He lived in Mecca. He made hijrah with the Muslims to Medina. But he was not actually from the Quraysh. He himself, his lineage was not from the Quraysh. But he lived with the Quraysh in Mecca and he assimilated with the Quraysh. But lineage-wise, no, he was actually not from the Quraysh. And he still had, even up to this point, he still had some family members that were still in Mecca. So Hatib ibn Abi Balta, he got worried. He said like, look, if the Muslims, if the Muslim army, if we go and we take over Mecca, maybe the Quraysh will harm my family members who are still there in Mecca. They don't have anyone from the Quraysh who is going to protect them because they are not actually from the Quraysh. So maybe the Quraysh, you know, in order to get revenge, they will hurt my family. So he feared for the family of his, uh, the, the, the safety of his family because they don't have a status as actually being from the Quraysh. So he got a little bit scared. And he thought, okay, in order to protect my family, I need to do some type of a favor to the Quraysh so that they will owe me. So that they will owe me a favor. If I do a favor to them, then they will owe me a favor. And my favor that I will take back from them is that I will demand that my family should be protected. So what he decided to do in order to give a favor to the Quraysh to thinking in his mind that he would be protecting his family, he decided to give them a heads up. He said, I will inform them that you know the Prophet ﷺ, he's coming to Mecca. That he's coming to Mecca. Right? This is a big mistake that he made. Right? He didn't do it though out of any type of hypocrisy or, or anything like that. No, but he did it, you know, out of his own human weakness. He became emotional thinking about his family and he made this huge mistake. So he decided to inform the Quraysh of the plan of the Prophet ﷺ. So how did he do this? He wrote a letter informing the Quraysh about the plans of the Prophet ﷺ. And he gave it to a woman. And he told her to sneak out of Medina. You know, the borders of Medina were closed, right? The, the main paths out of Medina were all shut down. So he told this woman, you have to go through some type of a, some, some type of a, uh, of an, uh, you know, uh, a, a non-used pathway one of the roads that are not used you know you have to sneak out of the city and go to Mecca and deliver this letter to the Quraysh so the woman she took that letter from Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a and she hid it inside the braids of her hair you know a small piece of paper she hid it inside the braids of her hair and she was able to sneak out of Medina and she started heading towards Mecca 
with this letter. Now, if the Quraysh find out the plans of the Prophet wasallam, this could have disastrous consequences. They could, you know, prepare themselves. They could get support from the outside. And, you know, it could lead to an all-out war between the Muslims and the Quraysh. And there would be a lot of blood shed on both sides. A lot of Muslim lives would be lost. A lot of lives of, of the Quraysh would be lost. It would be a big problem. And the Prophet wasallam, this is exactly what he did not want. So this woman, she goes out with this dangerous letter from Hatib ibn Abi Balta, and she's heading out towards Mecca. In the meantime, while this woman was on her way, in the meantime, the Prophet ﷺ received revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there is a woman and she has this letter and she is heading towards Mecca. Prophet ﷺ received revelation regarding this. So the Prophet ﷺ needs to make sure that this letter is intercepted. So who does he assign for this important mission, this task to intercept that woman and take the letter before she can reach Mecca? He has to send some people who are strong and trustworthy for this important mission. Who does he send? He sends Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, and Az Zubair ibn Al Awwam radiallahu an, and Al Miqdad ibn Al Aswad radiallahu an. Three great companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He sends these three on this mission to intercept the woman and bring back the letter, and he tells them exactly where they can find her to. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam receives revelation exactly where she's going to be to. So he told them, "In taliku hatta taatu rawda taqah, fa inna biha zainah wa maha kitab, fa khuduhu minha." He gave them very clear, precise instructions. Go until you reach rawda taqah. Rawda taqah. That's that's a place in between Medina and Mecca. Go until you reach rawda taqah, and you will find a woman, a woman who is alone. And she has a letter with her. This woman has a letter with her. Get that letter from her. These were the instructions given to Ali, Az Zubair, and Al Miqdad. So Ali radiallahu an, and Az Zubair radiallahu an, and Al Miqdad radiallahu an. The three of them, they embark upon this assignment given to them by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They go to Raudat Khakh and they find the woman there, exactly as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. This woman alone, she's there, on her horse. They stop her. They say, get down from your horse. Three men, three strong men telling this woman, get down from your horse. So, of course, she can't do anything. She gets down from the horse. And then they ask her, give us the letter. We know you have a letter. She says, I don't have any letter. What are you talking about? Then they search her, 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 her animal. They search, you know, the, the supplies that she had. They search everything. They cannot find the letter. But they know for sure she has the letter because the Prophet ﷺ, based upon the revelation that he received, he told them that she has a letter. So Ali radiallahu an says to her, Wallahi ma kathaba Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I swear by Allah that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa did not lie. He said you have a letter. I know you have the letter. So you better just give us the letter. Make it easy for yourself. Give us the letter or we will strip you of all of your clothes and we will find the letter. So then she got scared. So she said, okay, I'll give you the letter. She untied her hair and she gave them the piece of paper. So now they have this paper and they go back to the Prophet ﷺ, having completed this mission. And they have the letter in their hand. They go back to the Prophet ﷺ. It is read to the Prophet ﷺ. Prophet ﷺ, he can't read it himself. Right? So it is read to the Prophet ﷺ and it turns out that this is a letter from Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a great companion of the Prophet ﷺ who participated in the battle of Badr. But it's a letter from him addressed to the mushrikeen of the Quraysh informing them of the plans of the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ, he's with some of his companions including Umar ibn al-Khattab and he's with him. And the Prophet ﷺ calls for Hatib, bring Hatib here. So Hatib, he comes. The Prophet ﷺ has the letter. Hatib recognizes it. This is the letter that I wrote. And the Prophet ﷺ asks him, Ma hadha ya Hatib? What is this ya Hatib? And then Hatib says to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, Wallahi, I'm not a hypocrite. Wallahi, I have iman. I'm not a disbeliever. I have not committed apostasy, Ya Rasulullah. But I just did this because I thought that, you know, this is a way to protect my family in Mecca. They don't have anyone. So then the Prophet ﷺ, he believed him, that he's telling the truth. You know, he didn't do it out of hypocrisy or anything like that. 
But he did it out of, you know, this emotional weakness that he had. He made a wrong decision based upon, you know, his emotional weakness for his family. So when, when he gave this excuse to the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ told the companions who were with him, لَقَدْ صَدَقَكُمْ He's telling the truth. But Umar an was mad that how dare he do such a thing like this. So Umar an asked the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, دَعْنِي أَضْرِبْ عُنُقَ هَذَا الْمُنَافِقِ Ya Rasulullah, give me permission to cut the neck of this hypocrite. And then the Prophet wasallam he said to Umar radiallahu an, إِنَّهُ قَدْ شَهِدَ بَدْرًا وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ أَنْ يَكُونَ قَدْ اطَّلَعَ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَدْرِ فَقَالْ إِعْمَلُوا مَا شِئْتُمْ فَقَدْ غَفَرْتُ لَكُمْ He said to Umar, this man, Hatib, this man that you want to kill, this is a man who was present at Badr. He was from the Muslims who fought against the disbelievers on the day of Badr. You know, that's a very exclusive club. He is from those who witness Badr. And how do you know, Ya Umar? Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has looked upon the people of Badr and He has said to them, I'malu ma shi'tum, do whatever you want. فَقَدْ غَفَرْتُ لَكُمْ Because I have surely forgiven you. So Hatib ibn Abi Balta, his excuse was accepted. The Prophet ﷺ pardoned him because of his, his, his honor and his status as one of the companions who witnessed the Battle of Badr. Was it a big, was it a big mistake that Hatib made? Absolutely, a big mistake. But he did not do it out of, of lack of iman. He did not do it out of hypocrisy. Rather, he did it because of a weakness that he had, you know, thinking about his own family rather than thinking about the the whole situation right rather than looking at the bigger picture so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you you can see here in this incident the trust that he put in ali ibn abi talib radiyallahu anhu that ali radiyallahu anhu was one of those who was who was given this assignment to go and get that that dangerous letter back from uh, this woman before it could reach mecca all right so anyways alhamdulillah they're able to continue and the army is prepared and they leave Medina towards Mecca and they reach the outskirts of Mecca. And when they reach the outskirts of Mecca, this is a big army. Abu Sufyan, who is the leader of the Quraysh, he knows that the Quraysh cannot face this Muslim army. So the Prophet wasallam makes a deal with Abu Sufyan and Abu Sufyan agrees to surrender peacefully. And the Prophet wasallam announces for the people of Mecca. Remember, the Prophet wasallam does not want bloodshed. He does not want fighting. So he announces for the people of Mecca, everyone who is in their house, you go and enter your house, close the door of your house, you're safe. No one is going to harm you. And anyone who enters the house of Abu Sufyan is safe. He wanted to give some special honor to Abu Sufyan as well. right? So he said, anyone who enters the house of Abu Sufyan is safe. Anyone who enters their own house is safe. Don't be out on the streets. The Muslim army is going to come into Mecca now. So everyone go into your own homes. Everyone go into... Uh, or go to the home of Abu Sufyan, you know, you will be safe. So the Prophet ﷺ, basically, he instituted like what you could say, like a curfew in Mecca. Don't be out on the streets because we don't want any violence. We don't want any bloodshed. Everyone stay inside your homes. And this is what happened. And the Muslims, alhamdulillah, they came into Mecca and they took it peacefully. Now, the Muslim army consisted of many tribes now. Remember, in these two years, many tribes have accepted Islam. So the Muslim army, it consists of many tribes. And the Prophet ﷺ, he divided the army into different factions and each faction had a different leader, right? And as for the Ansar, the Muslims of Medina, the Prophet ﷺ put Sa'ad ibn Ubadah who was a great leader of the Ansar. He was a person of high status from the Ansar. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was in charge of the faction of the Ansar from, from this army. So Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, he has the flag for his group, for his part of the army, the Ansar, he has the flag. And as he is entering, he says loudly, Al-Yawm Yawmul Malhamah. Al-Yawm Yawmul Malhamah. This is the day of slaughter. We're going to kill the Quraysh. We're going to... You know, he said this out of his anger because you know everything that they have done over the years from Badr and Uhud and Khandaq, you know, 
the Muslims, they have lost a lot of lives because of, of, of the aggression of these people. So even though the Prophet ﷺ wanted everything to be done peacefully, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, he became emotional. And he, he saw that, look, this time, alhamdulillah, we are the ones who have the strength and the, the Quraysh are the ones who are weak today. So out, you know, out, out, of, out of his emotion, he said, اليوم يوم الملحمة Today is the day of slaughter. We're going to kill all of these people. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he heard this. And he knew that this is, this is not from the instructions of the Prophet ﷺ. This is not what the Prophet ﷺ wanted. And this is something that can actually, you know, this can incite some type of violence. And this is not what the Prophet ﷺ was wanting with this. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he goes and he tells the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, this is what Sa'ad is doing. This is what he is saying. He's saying, Al-Yawm Yawm Al-Malhama. Today is the day of the slaughter. So the Prophet ﷺ, he, he, he didn't want this. So he told Ali, Ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Again, look, look at the trust and the confidence he puts in Ali radiallahu anhu. He tells Ali radiallahu anhu, Ya Ali, go and take the flag from Sa'ad. We can't have this. Go and take the flag from Sa'ad and give it to Qais ibn Sa'ad, ibn Ubadah. Give it to the son of Sa'ad, Qais. So they're taking the flag away from Sa'ad, but if they take it away from him and just give it to someone else, then Sa'ad, he would feel bad. Like I had this honor and it was taken away from me and given to this person. It would, you know, there could be something that Sa'ad might hold in his heart with this. But if the flag is taken away from Sa'ad, but given to his own son, his son is, your son is a part of you. So if it's given to his own son, then that, that will make things you know, easier for him. So look, look at the Prophet ﷺ, look at this leadership. The Prophet ﷺ, he looks at the situation from all angles. Yes, the flag must be taken away from Sa'ad. Because, you know, we don't want any type of violence to be incited. And he's saying, So no, he cannot have the flag. But still, we don't want him to feel bad either. So we will give the flag to his son, Qais ibn Sa'ad. L look at this beautiful leadership from the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa So he appoints Ali radiallahu anhu to do this. So Ali radiallahu anhu, he goes to Sa'ad ibn Ubadah and he says, Ya Sa'ad, give me the flag. So Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, immediately he understands that Ali would not do this himself. This is an instruction that was given to him from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So immediately he surrenders the flag. He doesn't ask like, no, why? I, I need the flag. I'm the leader of the Ansar. No questions asked. He just gives the flag to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. So look at this. Look at, look at this, this obedience. The, the obedience that they had. Sami'na wa ata'na. When they know that this is an order from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, khalas, that's it. No questions asked. So immediately he gives the flag to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, and Ali radiallahu an, he gives that flag to, he, to the son of Sa'ad, to Qais ibn Sa'ad radiallahu an. So alhamdulillah, this is how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam diffused this situation. And alhamdulillah, everything went smoothly and Mecca was conquered peacefully, alhamdulillah. Now after the Fath of Mecca, after Mecca was conquered, alhamdulillah, the Prophet ﷺ sent some small armies to the neighboring areas of Mecca, you know, to conquer those lands as well. And one of the armies that the Prophet ﷺ sent was an army that was led by Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an to the tribe of Bani Jathima. And the instruction that was given to Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an was to call these people to Islam. And if they accept Islam, alhamdulillah, good. And if they don't accept Islam, fight them. So Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu was sent on this expedition. And due to a miscommunication, some tragic events occurred. And Ali radiallahu anhu was appointed by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to resolve that situation. And inshallah, we'll talk about that situation, the expedition of Khalid ibn al-Walid to Bani Jazima. We'll speak about that next week, inshallah, and we'll speak about how Ali radiallahu anh, by the, by the command of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was sent to fix this situation and to resolve this situation. Inshallah, we'll speak about that next week, bi-idhnillah. Barakallahu feekum. Wallahu alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.
I don't think I need it. It's fine, yeah. Because now this this stays firm. When it when the padding is under it, it always yeah, shifts, shifts, like, shifts, shifts a lot. Yeah. But this one stays firm. No, this is good. This is good. Just leave it like this. Barakallah. Inshallah. Now, do I have to go?